You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to this edition of the Apple Insider Podcast. This is episode 201. I'm Victor, and joining me is the willful William Gallagher. Okay, just processing that. It's really quiet this week. Is, is something going on in America at all this week? No. No? Okay. Right. Not a thing. Right. No, th- this week is it, it shouldn't be that difficult to understand. So we've had big news, right? We've had we've had Facebook and their troubles in the news. We've had Apple and they've released the devices and now they're sort of going through this cycle where <laughs> there are sorts of rumors floating about their production capability and orders and so their stock price is taking a hit, but so are the other stocks are down too. So <clears throat> it's it's kind of an interesting position. My perspective is, and we'll get to that, that is, is something we'll talk about in a moment. The winter holidays are ramping up, so it's time to start looking at deals on new phones from your carriers. And uh, and to that point, American Thanksgiving is tomorrow, or well, as we're recording this on Wednesday, we normally record on Thursday. So American Thanksgiving is tomorrow, Thursday, we'll release on Friday. And so there are a number of Black Friday deals going on. Now, Black Friday is an an American thing that has since traveled across the pond to your side. Yeah, though, weirdly, it somehow left Thanksgiving behind. So I'm I'm available anytime, just far away. You enjoy turkey or whatever it is. I'll be working. (laughs) You know, I have given thought, and I, I don't know if we've discussed it a whole lot, but I've been thinking that we ought to do a live show at some point. Okay. Right. You're saying this on air in a kind of let's commit to things way. No, 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 no. I'm not committing you to anything anymore. Okay. You were quite frustrated with me after I uh, after I committed you to do the giveaway from last episode. So, no, we're not doing that. But the I've had some thoughts. You know, there are different ways that we could do this. We could get listener feedback by having a, a shared document that they could put in the topics that they wanted us to comment on. We could actually do a a YouTube version of the show, we could do a YouTube live version of the show. There there are a number of different avenues that we can explore. And so what I'd like to do is request some listener feedback on what would be interesting. You know, how can we involve them more? How can we involve you out there more in the show? What do you think of that? Uh, well, uh, your show, up to you. I think you're being brave, but let's see what happens. Okay. Life is no fun without a little risk. What can we do? We could have some fun. Could be good. I want to mention something here. So this is something that broke this morning. This is news that just happened. And by the time you hear it, it will be two days old. But I think it's still interesting. We've talked in the past about what I've what I've called the voice first interface. And it's this notion that as things develop, looking at screens, whether large or small, sort of becomes a secondary interface. And the way that I think of this is that in the beginning, there was the command line, which is the name of an excellent book that's now very old, by the way, but it's still fun, I think by Neil Stevenson. And the command line was very powerful, but limited to a small number of users who had access to machines that could do it, right? In the beginning, there were Unix, DEC 5s, DEC 10s, PDP 8s, whatever. And then the command line spread to things like the Apple and Apple II and spread to the IBM PC. And then we got the mouse interface. So the command line lasted nominally about 10 years. Well, I still nip into terminal every now and again. As a predominant interface or as the only interface. Sure. Yes. And then from, let's say, 84 to, um, you know, 90, 95 or so, we got the mouse interface predominant, right? And it became widespread. And, and it really grew to being accessible to everyone, right? Every computer had a mouse. And along the way, that modified slightly as we got touchpads and trackpads. Yeah, but it's still the norm. That's what you mean. Yes, pointing, clicking. Pointing, yeah. clicking is still the vocabulary. But the trackpad began to allow you to do things to draw, which you didn't have the flexibility to do well with the mouse necessarily. Yes, Right, okay. finer control, finer control. Yes. And then along about 2007, so a few decades on, we got touch properly. Of course, touch had been going on before that. So if you want to, to pin touch down to where it really began, you got about 10 years of mouse before touch happened. 
Okay, the glory years of the mouse, yes. Right. Yeah. And now we are very nearly precisely 10 years on from touch, and we have voice. Hey, we have voice is we have uh, voice optimistic way of listen, putting it. Well, no, but if, you, if, if we're counting from the beginning, the birth of touch for 10 years away from mouse, then this is the birth of voice 10 years away from Mm, okay. From touch. Yeah. Mm, mm. Now, what happens is that as these interfaces become more accessible to everyone, they become more widespread, right? The, so the person who didn't have access to or, or the knowledge to interact with a mouse can act on a touchscreen. The person who doesn't know how to act on his touchscreen because there are all these icons and what's an app store and all of this stuff can speak. Right. Oh, and people like me who are used to having servants do everything, I can speak now as well to the computers. I see your point, yes. Well, so the fellow in in a far-off land that needs to know when the train schedule is but doesn't have the wherewithal to install an app store or go to an app store and find the train app that's relevant for his region and then input his, where he is and what track – all the stuff that you'd have to do to get that lined up, right? You and I can take that for granted, mm -hmm. but not everyone can. But being able to say, when's the next train arrive that goes to this location and have it hit the GPS, grab the location, and come back with relevant data is a huge leap forward, right? Well, yes, absolutely. And, and I, I have taken that leap. I use this service here, Siri, uh, a great deal, particularly with shortcuts. Yes. And so – you know, it's it's possible that we don't get rid of the, the touchscreen entirely, but that by having this voice interface become predominant, opens computing up to the rest of the people in the world. There there are, let's say, se there are 7 billion people in the world. Yeah? Okay. There's 7 billion people in the world. There are nominally about a billion iPhone users. Yes. Okay. And as these devices age out and are replaced with newer, more capable devices, the voice interfaces go along with them. And we reach a point where the voice interface can be on anything and it doesn't have to be on a pretty piece of glass. Okay. I think <clears throat> we, we, the only thing we're going to differ on here is that uh, I think you see voice as replacing all of these other things. And if you try to take my keyboard away, we will arm wrestle. Yeah. I like voice. But I, I think through my fingers as I'm typing. That's when how I you break write. your hands, when your hands fall apart due to carpal tunnel and arthritis, what are you going to do? Cry. And yes. I'm not kidding now, there. Now, David yeah. Pogue, who was a New York Times author and then went to Yahoo and is now going back to the New York Times, um, for years has suffered with his hands and for decades has used Dragon Naturally Speaking to compose all of his articles. Is this the same dragon that's just pulled out of doing Mac apps? Yes, it is. Okay. Stick with the keyboard then, I think. Uh, and, although I didn't know that about David Pogue, and I really like his writing. So. And what, what David does is he has for years, because Dragon on Mac has kind of lagged between, behind its PC competitor for a long time, off and mm -hmm. on, is that he has used Dragon on PC solely to compose as he's documenting his Mac. Okay. He loves his Mac, but he's he's using the PC to do that. And, you know, people will make all kinds of accommodations in their lives in order to be able to to create the work they need to create. And that's that's how he uses the tools to do it. Now, what if that PC can be completely replaced by a device? Whether it's the iPhone or uh, Amazon Alexa or Google Home or something else. This is kind of where things are going. Now, Amazon wants this future badly. Because Amazon failed with the Amazon Fire Phone. And so Amazon wants the voice assistant. And then Amazon Alexa as a voice assistant came out of that Fire Phone work. When the phone died, they said, well, we got this assistant. What are we going to do with it? And so oh, okay. if, if they can, and then that's why their big plan has been to allow people to run Alexa on anything. You know, that's why they started it very early by letting hackers run on Raspberry Pi, by letting people of third parties put it into their products. You know, Amazon doesn't want to make a refrigerator, but they can darn sure allow people to put Alexa into the refrigerator or the thermostat or the oven or whatever. And so that's that's where this goes. That's where this comes from. And that's why they want this future badly is because that puts them back in the running. The phrase I know for this is ambient computing. And I really like the idea of being able to sit in my office and just, you know, make a phone call by asking my HomePod 
but whatever. Um, I don't have a home pod. I was about I don't to say, have you? <laughs> easily do this. Um, isn't it still the ca- no? I haven't. But you know, Christmas is coming and Black Friday, so you so know. you're going to get one for each of us. Seems likely, doesn't it? Oh, very. Okay. Um, I uh, this is a small, very specific point. I don't believe, uh, as far as I know, you can't just call over to your home pod and ask it to make phone calls. But that type of thing, that type of functionality, well, you in can, my office, you you can useful. ask it to text. Yeah, but I do. I actually, I do texting by voice on my watch uh, so much as that's become muscle memory now. Turn the wrist, say the text, get on with it. Uh, right. I would have to positively stop to think to just talk out into the air uh but again i'm this uh, this happens with me um i don't have a home pod can't do ambient computing yet but the talking business does it as part of everything else i do for example and i'm sorry i know you're going to a point and this just popped in my head and it's kind of leading us down a, a very short alley i promise uh, i had a thing not very long ago where i was so busy typing i did not have time to add an appointment to the calendar that i really needed to so i said to my phone next to me um i told it to uh, add an appointment it was at an appointment on sunday at 10 o'clock with jilly um i suppose jilly valley i was supposed to phone her for an interview thing and fine it did that that's very nice they carried on typing doing what else uh, three or four hours later i stop i go to the calendar to do something else and i see yes of course it's put that thing in on sunday but it has also invited Jilly because she was the only Jilly in my um, contacts list and she had accepted. Now, that was very good and very impressive, except it was also scary because one day before I had used my voice to add an event to my calendar that I called stupid waste of time meeting I don't want to go to. Now, imagine if it had flung that over to Jilly or somebody else that was in the meeting. I could have been, you know, severely in trouble over it so one no has to no be no 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 that would be brilliant because it would have meant that your meeting was very short problem yeah. solved this is excellent work <laughs> oh I'm i know i know not i'm really sure we're getting that there but okay <laughs> yes um productivity wise in that minute i would have saved uh i, fin- I can't remember but i think it's three hours minutes, long yeah. when I finally went oh to dear so wow. yeah i would have saved three hours and never worked for them again so, yeah, look at all the time I would have saved. You're right. Yeah. Go me, for voice. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, so let me tell you about a meeting I was at at Google once. I was at a meeting at Google, and the meeting started very, very optimistically. We had a bunch of people there and a bunch of people in the room, very important people, very important meeting for me and, and the team that I was with. And along about five minutes into the meeting, two guys got up and started excusing themselves. And then a few minutes later, three more people got up and excused themselves. And, and I was just watching as another fellow from my team was leading the meeting. And these people from Google were, were getting up and leaving and excusing themselves. And Google has the practice where if a meeting does not appear to be worth their while mm. or getting to the point quickly – they just leave. They just okay. go. I'm sorry, but I think that's asinine. I like Steve Jobs' <laughs> thing of saying, I don't need you for this meeting. You can go. But somebody sitting there and unilaterally making a decision uh, that this isn't worth my time and walking out. That's I can oh, understand yeah. that one. But the one of it's not getting to the point fast enough. So they don't say we're not getting to the point fast enough. Can we do this? They just walk. I think yeah. that's, that's, that's just Oh, it was time. really very scary. I was, I was kind of shocked. But – that's what they did at that time. No, it's worse than that. I mean, they, they've wasted their time up to there in the meeting. They were there in their place. They had the opportunity to find out what they needed by just asking and saying that we need to get somewhere. And instead, they decided to make a show and walk out of it. I just think that is uh, deeply insulting in, to everybody involved and far, far worse a waste of time than them spending a few minutes in the meeting and then asking what they want and then leaving. Walking out is just making a show. and um, Yeah, and- but it was an abysmal failure for me. It was just like nightmares. Oh, right. Watching this happen before your eyes and not being able to do anything to stop the train wreck. Right. Very painful. But, you know, since we're talking about things that are awkward and Google in the same sentence. <laughs> what are the odds? Okay, <laughs> yes. Oh, what have you done? You've broken something, haven't you? Google yeah? make a product called a Google Home Mini. Well, it's Google Home Max, Google Home. They, they make a range. Mm-hmm. And Google Home has on it the Google Assistant, which you summon typically by saying, hey, Google, or OK, Google. Yes? Yes. Yeah? Yep. Come across and this. Google, very clever people, by the way, they've taken advantage of Siri shortcuts on iOS to make their own Google Assistant more useful so that you can say to Siri, 
that you want to prompt the shortcut that says, OK, Google. So you can say, hey, Siri, OK, Google, or whatever other <laughs> trigger word you use to trigger the Google Assistant. You can say, okay. tell Google. You could say, hey, Siri, OK, Google, do this action, and it will do it through Google Assistant as the, instead of Siri. Right. So I'm laughing because I actually find the whole hey and, you know, uh, really tedious. And I love the fact that, uh, isn't it, with the Series 4 watch, you just say what you want. You know, let it figure out that you're talking to it. That's the way it should be, not adding on more trigger phrases in a row. Right. Yeah. Well, so the, the syntax for this, this get wake the assistant and then tell something else to do something else is a common syntax from Alexa and from Google Home. For example, General Electric make a range of products. And they have a skill that they've named Geneva. Mm -hmm. Now, they've named it Geneva because personalizing the assistant has a profound effect on people's interaction with it. If you, and, and Google have learned this the hard way, uh, naming Amazon's assistant Alexa was very beneficial for people using it, except for people who happen to be named Alexa. Sure. Was disastrous for those, but but for, for other everyone else, that helped gain adoption. Siri... Likewise, we can personalize it. It takes on a personification. It, it becomes something we can address and act and interact with sort of humanly. And that bears out. People will do that as opposed to if it's named as the service. And so Google put themselves on the back foot by not giving it a clever name. But the syntax for Alexa and the syntax for Google is to say, hey, Alexa, or OK, Google, tell Geneva to go do this thing to my stove, right? Tell okay. Geneva to put the water on for the, the tea. Mm -hmm. And so that's the sort of clunky syntax that we're at so far. However, it kind of works. So what they've done is they've grafted this clunky syntax onto Google. So then you now get, hey, Siri, tell Google to turn on my ceiling fan. Right. So what you're saying is by the time you've constructed the sentence in exactly the right way to trigger the right command, you could have just gone and you know, switched on this fan thing for you. Okay. But it, I presume it's the start of something that will make sense. I think it is. And I think it's interesting. Now, I'm kind of a this, – this appeals to me in a sense. One of the things that I'm concerned about is privacy. And, and of course, I still need to test these things. And so I find sort of a range or a balance between how much I'm willing to push or pull or let go or keep, keep close. And do I like the idea of have Google listen to everything that I do or say? Not necessarily. Do I like that Siri is the gatekeeper for Google? That, that becomes interesting because then Google doesn't hear anything until you decide explicitly to allow it through Siri. Uh, taking as read that we trust Siri and Apple, and as, as it happens in this case, I actually do. So, yeah. yes, I see your point there. Okay, that, that does change things. Okay, yeah. Now, I, I do have the Google Home Mini, and that would mean not using that. would mean still being desirable to have a HomePod so that you keep Siri as the gatekeeper all the way around. Yes. Now, of course, with Siri, things aren't perfect either because... I was looking at this, and Siri shortcuts mm -hmm. work on iOS devices and HomePod. Yes. They do not work with Siri on Mac. Sure. They do not work with Siri on CarPlay. Now, I'd expect that, and I'm okay with that because the car is a very different environment. But but you would think that Siri well, on I'm, Mac should I be able to pick did. up on this, uh, and it doesn't. On the, Mac, uh, on the Mac, you have Automator, you have Apple Script, you have Keyboard Maestro, you have... Uh, what, 20 or 30 different automation tools that are all far more powerful than Siri shortcuts. So I see Siri shortcuts, because uh, although Siri is on the Mac, um, I never use it on the Mac, and I use it continually on everywhere else. Okay, but, I, yeah. but this, is, this is a bad thing, because if you have Siri shortcuts created and you begin to get into the habit of using them with your phone, mm -hmm. then they should work identically from the Mac. No, I don't agree. Yes, I, yes, I, you can have nice. all these other powerful tools. But if you get in the habit of doing a shortcut that starts your morning routine and you happen to be at your Mac instead of your phone, then it should darn well work the same way. Well, uh, it's been a while since I took my uh, Mac to bed with me. Uh, no, I can see why you one would enjoy having this facility, but I, I really don't agree because everything, all my shortcuts are very clearly um, iOS related. Uh, the things I get it to, there is a morning routine. It does fire up the lights in certain places in the house, including my office. I could, I suppose, add a smart switch to switch on the Mac, but frankly, the Mac is on all the time because it's doing all sorts of things. Um, yeah. Now, I mean, if I've got... My phone reads me the news. 
Um, I don't need my Mac to do that as well. I've got Home for HomeKit on my Mac. I've got other iOS apps on my Mac, courtesy of Marzipan. Siri shortcuts needs to be... Siri, really, the Siri experience needs to be more universal across all of these things. i definitely go along with it. It'd be great if it were, but needs to be... I'm needs to be. No, it needs to be. Because it is, it is holding it back. But not for me. I use Siri many, many, many times a day, and I, and most of the time it works. It's great. It's very frustrating when it doesn't. But no, completely don't need it on the Mac. I mean, I always wanted it on the Mac, and I'm astonished that I don't use it at all on the Mac, but I don't. So I am not sitting here uh, typing with cross fingers, hoping that one day Apple will rescue me on the Mac. Well, it, it comes down to where does the Mac fit in within things, and is the Mac a full citizen or not? And from the last event, you'd seem to think that they would be, but this this lack of keeping Siri on the Mac, keeping pace with the rest of the devices, is is giving me frustration. Okay, so right. let's carry. Let's move on now. Incidents are inevitable, and it all comes down to how your company responds. Incidents require complex coordination between operations and software development teams, who are the unsung heroes putting out fires every day. Getting alerts immediately is critical when an incident occurs, and that's why there's Ops Genie by Atlassian. Ops Genie empowers devs and ops teams to plan for service disruptions and stay in control during incidents. It gives teams the power to respond quickly and efficiently to unplanned issues and helps to notify all the right people through a smart combination of scheduling and escalation paths that takes into account things like time zones and holidays and allows for deep flexibility in how, when, and where alerts are deployed, supported by more than over 200 integrations like Jira, Amazon CloudWatch, Datadog, New Relic, and more. And it tracks all activity and provides useful insights to improve future incident responses. You know, it's it's so important when, when things go down, when services go down, when servers go down, when, when things break, getting them back up quickly is what everyone wants. And people put their hair on fire. You know, if you can't have this thing back up in 30 minutes, you're you're out of a job. And, and you know, I've seen people pack up their things at that because they've already said it's going to take three hours to fix this. Why are you packing up? Well, you gave me 30 minutes to do it. And watching people backpedal from that kind of response is, is you have never seen anything take place more quickly. No, 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 no. That's all right. Keep going. You're still hired because, you know, people, people act irrationally when things are broken. But getting the notification early goes so far at helping them get fixed faster. You know, if you don't realize for 10 hours that things are offline, you're 10 hours behind. And, and all of this comes down to keeping services up, staying in control. With Ops Genie, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. Visit OpsGenie.com to sign up to get a free company account and add up to five team members. That's OpsGenie.com. Never miss a critical alert again with Ops Genie. A hundred thousand years ago, I worked on a PC magazine and I was the only one reviewing laptops. We lost all power in the building, and I didn't notice because it just went straight to battery power. I looked up, and half the room around me had left. Now, yay for battery power, but they could have said something. Even <laughs> I. Well, I have put a portion of my networking equipment on battery backup. And so in the event of a failure, I will have internet for 16 hours because I, I haven't got everything. I am not running the, the monster switch, the 24-port. The 24 port gigabit switch is not on battery backup, but the little eight port is. Okay. Um, and, sorry, my mind went straight to that's nice if the power outage is very local, but if the you know the exchange is near you, the cell towers and all this stuff goes out, so you're just looking at some nice flashing lights for 16 hours. Nope, nope. So the the internet here that I've got is powered over fiber provided over fiber. So the fiber doesn't require power itself. It just requires it at the um, at the fiber hut. Mm -hmm. And the fiber huts have very large batteries. Oh, but that's nice. Okay. And right. so so they can keep internet up for days. Okay. And I can give up for 16 hours. So provided my Mac battery is worth a darn, then then we've got internet for a good long while in the event of a failure. <laughs> There's still a bit of me that would think, why is there such a big failure? Is this a catastrophic moment? Should I really be on Facebook at this time or running away? <laughs> um, usually in this part of the world, it's trees down. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, because uh, actually, that not that why America has 911 instead of uh, the UK's 999? Um, uh, actually, both of them are to do with trees and damage like that. It was always important. It was 
always possible to accidentally trigger a 111 on a phone line through a mechanical process, like something hitting a line. But 999 was uh, considered impossible. Pulse dial. That's pulse, the one. Pulse dial mm -hmm. is, yeah. is where small pulses of electricity down the line created the dial tone, created the, the dialed number. And a 111 was fairly easy to generate, right? Mm. So there you go. Even have it. I could do that with my sort of dynamic personality, yes. Well, old lineman's handsets before we got touch tone used to be just the handset and two clips. And <laughs> you'd, you'd clip in and reach a real live operator. And, uh, and then eventually, when you no longer got a real live operator, you had lineman handsets that had number pads on them that could pulse dial. But you could, you know, just tap your, your clips and yeah. be able to do it too. And yet again, technology costs people their jobs. Well, That's but, this, what we're but this is interesting because that ties back into Apple's history with the black and the blue boxes that Jobs and Woz oh, yes. made when they were in university to dial, right? They created the, yes. the boxes to be able to dial around the world. And Woz has the apocryphal story that he used to tell about dialing the Pope in the Vatican. Yes. Okay. <laughs> right. So how did we get into this? This went down a very strange route. Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, what you're saying is that Woz should have been able to just say, oi, box thing. No. Bring that Pope fella. Yeah. <laughs> Next. Yeah. Now, the the iPhone XR sales have picked up in China due to what they call Singles Day as a retail event over there. That's um, November 11th is Singles Day because oh, it's all 11111, right? Oh, I see. Yeah, that's clever. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Uh, Jun Zhang from Rosenblatt claims that the boost isn't enough to prevent the analysts from reducing their production estimates for iPhones for the next two quarters. So... They they say sell through improved during the uh, November eleventh holiday. Sales increased largely due to online retailers. They're giving discounts between ten and fifteen percent. Uh, they say after one month of unit sales, the iPhone XR has reached the same level as the XS Max over there, and has surpassed the XS after both devices had two months of sales in China. Now this is encouraging, but the the idea is that you know this. What, what's what's the peak sales, right? Peak sales for a device tend to happen when it's released and in mm. holiday sales. And then after that, it sort of peters off while people sort of hold out for the next model. Sure. Right? And so if, if everyone's saying that they think sales are weaker than expected, then they're also anticipating that the tapering off will be weak. Right. But the people who've just said this, that the sales were better in China and things, are they not the same people that said, go, sales are down everywhere? And now they're saying, well, yeah, OK, apart from the fact that it's selling as well as the XS, the XS Max, uh, but it's going to be rubbish as well. Isn't well, it just no, no. So maybe it did this for the sales holiday with discounts, but those discounts aren't hold and the holiday doesn't hold, right? There's no sustainability to that. It just, it's going to, that was the peak. Now it's going to taper off, they're saying. Okay. Although if that peak was in the peak of a, a new device sales, that seems fine to me. I just, I've, I've come to disregard um, this phone isn't selling well than that phone because it just, yeah, a few months later, it seems to be the, exactly the opposite. And I guess I've got one, so I don't care. Yeah. That's very selfish of me. I'm sorry. So I'm sorry, Apple. I should be more concerned for you. Yeah. They believe that Apple is targeting production of about 32 million iPhone XR units in the fourth quarter, which is is why they think that the company might need to cut production again after the holiday season. Nice. You know, they that they really... It's a staggering number, isn't it? It is. I mean, it is. You just throw but, these figures around. And you start to but, nothing. you know, if you're producing 32, when the next quarter, you're only going to need 18. So you cut production, right? Uh, one imagines, yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, the only question is, is that... Are, are these numbers real? And and the answer is not necessarily because Apple hasn't really given any guidance. They don't give unit sales. They don't tell people what they're producing. So yes. it's not clear at all that that's correct, first of all. Um, so so this is all speculation. You know, when we say that that Apple's 10R sales total surpass, slightly surpass the total sales for the 10S and 10S Max, and the 10S and 10S Max sales are currently expected to be 18 million units so far this quarter. Okay. Right. So that if if the 10R is surpassing those combined, and those are 18 million, then the 25 to 28 million units for 10R makes sense. Targeting a production of 32 million means that that there are that you know sales coming from elsewhere. Right. That's not just the China. That's the total production. Right. 
None of this adds up. Well, just because we're missing some facts here, but we always are, and they're sometimes enormous. Um, I think you try to join the dots to make it work, and I, at some point I've just decided I'm never going to know. Um, let's see what happens next. So the, the the real issue here is that because of these rumors about this and then these speculations from these analysts, people are selling off their Apple stock, which has caused the price to go down. Yes. Now, Apple's weathered this sort of stuff before, but you know they, they have a pretty solid business. They really do. There's, there's, mm -hmm. I, I think this is a emotional driven and a lack of information driven dip. Yes. I think. And, you know, I, I own some shares. I don't own a lot of shares. I, I am not worried. You're I'm not, not telling, yourself. I'm not telling anyone else what to do. I'm not offering advice. I'm just saying that, that this is something that doesn't really concern me greatly. It is a temporary thing. Would it help thing. you if you just, I don't know, gave me some of your shares, for example? Would that make you feel better in any possible way? Not really. Okay, had to try. In, in terms of the, in it. terms of the things that 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 put my mind at ease and put my heart at ease and 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 comfort me late at night, giving William shares is not one of them. Okay, you should try it though, because you might find it's better than cocoa. I might. Many things are better than cocoa. They but are. Everything. Many things Absolutely. are better than cocoa. You know yes. what's better than cocoa? Uh, chocolate with chili in it. Maybe. Okay. But you're, you're going to laugh. And it's okay if you're going to laugh. But <clears throat> just like I like to surround myself with the best uh, consumer electronics, because I value good experiences, I also like to surround myself with what I find to be the best in other ranges of product types. Right. No surprise so far. Yes. And it's it's I, I've allowed myself to become a little particular and a little selective and just, you know, sometimes spoil myself by spending on things that I think are better quality. Are you building to tell me you've just bought a Tesla? I have not, and I am not. Okay. Um, what I am telling you is that I, I apply this to as many things as I can around me. You know, I will hold off on buying an item in order to buy the better one. And and right now I'm talking about clothing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mack Weldon is a online retailer that has has gone out of their way to try and address clothing and address fabric. And you know, they, they started by trying to figure out how to make socks better, right? And how to make the the this all of these things better so they started by from scratch they engineered their own fabric and what i like from them is that they sell things that are made from from bamboo cloth which is a, a more durable cloth they sell things that have silver woven into it and silver has the unique property of absorbing both a little bit of radiation which i know is inconsequential scientifically but whatever and and also has the unique property of absorbing odor which is kind of cool and really what it came down to is that they're some of the most comfortable uh, shirts that I've ever worn. I love the socks. I love the shirts. And so it's it's been my experience that when I put on a Mack Weldon shirt, it's better than whatever else I was wearing before. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not too far out of range to say that they believe in smart design and premium fabrics because that's really what it comes down to. It is, it is smart design. It is premium fabrics. And it's simple shopping. The shopping experience was really easy. Um, it will be the most comfortable socks, shirts, undershirts, hoodies, and sweatpants you'll ever wear. And the line of silver products are, are antimicrobial, which means they absorb odor. They eliminate the odor. And they want you to be comfortable. So if you don't like your first pair, you can keep it and they'll refund you. These things look good and they perform well too. It's good for working out. It's good for going to work. It's, it's just good for life. Now, I have my, my personal ones are the V-neck t-shirts. I just love them. And using the website was super easy. And I, I, if I could redo my whole wardrobe and the stuff, I probably would. That's just where I stand on it. Um, that's it. So for 20% for off your first order, visit MacWeldon.com and enter the promo code Apple Insider at checkout. I'm glad you like this so so much, but I'm also a, bit, a little bit relieved actually because I thought you were building up this. You know, you were, you were laying the groundwork there for how it sounded like um, 
you are willing to take effort and time to get something that you feel is a better experience. I thought you were building up to firing me and finding somebody better. That's where that sounded like it was going. William, I, I haven't properly expressed how much I enjoy doing this with you. And I really do. Oh. It's a oh, lot of you. fun. Very nice. and, and so you don't have to worry about being fired this week. <laughs> nice little last bit. I feel like, um, you know, uh, I mean, I know it's your show, but um, I'm really just here while I think Mike, Mike Worthily uh, is busy saving the world. That's the way I look at it, you see. So this is a treat uh, for me. It's very nice to get to natter about these things. But every now and again, you ask me technical stuff and I have to whimper a little bit. But, you know, that's me. You know, what, what I try and remember is that we have a range of listeners some of them who are very highly uh, aware on the technical spectrum, some who are very highly aware on the business spectrum, and some who maybe aren't, maybe are listening because they want this information or listening because they like hearing you talk about tea or are listening because it gives us the opportunity to educate. And I, I think we have to remember that not everyone comes at this information from the same place. So it's, it's a matter of trying to, to really inform in a way that works for all of our audience. And, and to that point, I want to talk about this product review that I did on the site this week. So I reviewed a device that uh, Zixel, with a Z, Z-Y-X-E-L, is a networking company, and they released a Wi-Fi mesh node system. And they did it a little bit differently than some of the other ones we've seen. And... By differently, it's it's something where I had to assign two different review ratings. And this is kind of unusual because normally it's possible to just say, yeah, this product got so many stars. This product was so many out of five, right? But here, the difficulty was that for some users, this product is totally a four out of five, five out of five, right? High level product. Great. Good for them. But for other users, it stinks on ice and is 2.5 out of five. Okay. <laughs> so... So how, you know, writing the review was sort of difficult. It was a tug of war because they did some things very well. And then there's some things, some things shockingly, right? And, and so let me lay it out. This thing is a two mesh node system. Some competitors use three nodes, but this is a two node system. It's what they call an AC3000 system. An AC3000 says that it's 802.11ac, which is now going to be rebranded as Wi-Fi 6. Take that as it is. It's the fastest Wi-Fi we have available in our laptops and our iPhones at this time. It, the 3000 means that there are three radios in it, and the sum of all of the megabit per second speeds of those radios adds up to 3000. So there's a 400 megabit per second, 2.4 gigahertz band radio. There's a 5 gigahertz radio that's at 866 megabit per second, and there's a 1300 megabit per second radio in five gigahertz that's used solely for backhaul between the nodes. And the point of that is that it means that your client devices aren't sharing radio bandwidth, radio traffic with the radio that is sending the data from the mesh node back to the main node to get you to the internet. I'm sorry. I'm just thinking there's an awful lot of numbers in this conversation. Well, all those numbers add up to 3,000. So it's sold yeah. at 3, 000, as, as a 3,000 device. But it, when you connect on the different radios, you'll get different speeds. But the fastest radio is the one that is transferring the information between the two nodes. And that's a good thing because that means that it doesn't have any bottlenecks. And it's not having the bandwidth to try and share it and split it with the client device. So that's a good design point. It's a good thing. The, 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 the problems start to come where we look at the things they've done intentionally to limit it. For example, each node is identical in hardware, and each one can be the main one when you set it up. You just have to choose which one's the main one and which one is the, the node. And the, because they're identical, if you unplug them and replug them in and don't remember which one is which, it can be a little hard to identify. You might have to reset the whole thing up, which I did several times in testing. <laughs> Um, they both have a gigabit WAN port or wide area network port. That's the port that goes to the internet. And they have a three port switch that is local ports that are all gigabit. Now with all those ports on the main node, you can connect three different devices to it with a wire and have them be very fast, as fast as your internet will allow, basically as fast as the switch will allow. The problem is that the mesh node has those same ports, but you can't use them. And people who are a little bit at the higher technical end 
tend to have in-wall wiring for Ethernet and should be able to use the wire for backhaul between those devices instead of the wireless backhaul and get even faster. And yet they're being denied this. Yes. <sighs> okay. Um, when I was setting it up, you know, it, it tends to use DHCP to distribute an IP address to your client devices. That is, it has one IP address that comes in from the outside world and then it assigns ones for your local area network. Sure. Yes. And it assigns them in a very specific IP range, 192.168.212.1. Now, if you've got a network already and you want to migrate to this thing, your home network is almost assuredly not going to be in that 212 part of the range. It's going to be at 1.1 or 0.1 or something else. And so now you've got to reassign all your devices. And if you've got devices that you've assigned a static IP address because they never move, like your printer, your printer doesn't change addresses. Why should it? It's always there. It should always be the same thing so that your devices can find it, right? Now, yeah. that's, that's a, alleviated a little bit by device discovery techniques using AirPrint or Bonjour or stuff like that. But come on. Come off of it. And you can reserve static IP addresses for devices within the Zixel stuff, but they're going to be in that 212 range which is just weird. I, I mean, I knew about the one on eight, one six eight, all this stuff. Yeah. I, I don't particularly know about the 212 range. I just no, recognize it's, the numbers. It's, it's arbitrary. What? It's totally arbitrary. But the idea that they force you into using a specific one and letting you, and, um, and not letting you set your own is, okay. is also yeah. arbitrary and kind of dumb. So if you were a new user setting up Wi-Fi for the first time and didn't care about having static devices reserved at specific addresses and anything, then this would be perfect for you. And it worked great. But if you're a user that happens to have some networking things already in place, then maybe it isn't the right answer. Right. Okay. And for people somewhere in the middle, it's just going to be confusing. Well, for people somewhere in the middle, it means that you you make that choice. Are you willing to make the small changes to be whatever you need to be there? Okay. There's something I imagine you can't tell me about all this. You've got all of these details, but there's a fact. I, I probably bet money you don't know mm. and that's whether this is available in the uk because um i'm sorry i've blanked um there was a particular mesh wi-fi system that kept getting great reviews and has for at least two years and it keeps never being released in the uk and i don't know why whether it's a legislative thing or something any idea whether this is a worldwide product yet i'm telling you that it is on zixel's uk website excellent well, half and, excellent, depending on what you say. Yeah. And if I go to their UK shop on their UK website. Wait, are you going to tell me another number, but this time with a pound symbol in front of it? Excellent. I'm attempting to. While you're looking, I am secretly a bit worried about all, all this thing, the serious stuff we're talking about, people learning things from us and stuff. I was working in a school the other day, and this, this seven-year-old uh, said that she'd learned something from me. I, I was aghast. I'm not there to teach you something. We're there to write. Yeah, What's going on? Absolutely. I put her in detention and gave her a test. But, there you, you know, go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. In fact, you can purchase this thing in the UK from people like Ingram Micro UK or Exertis or uh, Tech Data. Right. I love the fact that you have just <laughs> – I mean, I've heard of the first one, but the other two – I live here and I've not heard of the other two companies. Isn't well, it a funny one? So, but... so those are distributors, right? And, and they distribute into shops. So those are the approved distributors. And Exertus is a distributor in Hampshire, in Basingstoke. And uh, Ingram Micro is in Milton Keynes. So it's Basingstoke, by the way, is how if you're going to be posh, as I, you should be, speak about Basingstoke. I, whatever. Yeah. It matters to them. But OK, uh, so you're telling me these are the people that shove it into shops like um, Curry's yes. and PC World or whichever one of these still survives. Right. Yes. And and what I'm saying is, is that it, because they're distributing it in the UK, it should be possible to buy it. So Amazon Co. UK has it. eBuyer.com has it. Broadband Buyer Co. UK has it. Box Co. UK. Great. So it's well, possible. again, half great. Um, if you hadn't told me the good and the bad pits, I, I might, and assuming I had the money, because you still haven't told me the price, I might well have gone to get this because I would like this kind of functionality. But um, it does sound like a lot of work to get it to do what you need. Uh, well, so a th the two-router system is uh is 249 pound oh really that is a i don't know what i was imagining but that's less than i thought okay a three mesh system a three node system is 369 pounds okay now if you bought the two node system and decided you wanted another one you could just add one for 129 or you could start by just getting the single one for 129 Right. Okay. And it would be a very strong wi-fi signal it's a really good system in terms of, of signal spread and, and distribution 
Well, there are specific parts of my house and office that um, are like dead zones for some reason. Uh, so that might be a good thing for the future. Hmm. That might be your answer. Well, we are rapidly running out of time. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time on some of this stuff. There are, as I said, Black Friday sales in the U.S. Check out AppleInsider.com for them because you will find that people are doing things like an iPhone 7 for $5 a month or a free iPhone XR when you comply with the other terms of their deals or a buy one, get one iPhone 8 deal. So there are all kinds of things going on here that, that you should pay attention to for this. Tim Cook had his interview with CNN back in October, and they're now releasing more parts of that. They're stretching it out a little bit. So he's talking about things like self-driving cars and, you know, stuff like that. One of the things that I liked about this interview was when asked about Steve Jobs and how Steve Jobs' shadow informs his personal legacy, uh, Cook said, I don't think about it. I just do stuff. Hmm. That is when, yes. when, you know, how does Steve Jobs' shadow inform Tim Cook's legacy? I don't think about it. I just do stuff. Well, that sounds good. That makes sense. I'm just, I didn't, I hadn't, I knew this new interview. Knew it. I knew this new interview. I didn't realize that it was the October one being milked yep. this long. Yes. Okay. Now, mm. he did say in, in, when talking about the autonomous vehicle project, we are working on autonomy, autonomous systems on the software side, to be very clear. Right. Not letting on too much. No, I was hoping you were going to say something more then that was letting on things, but... Uh, well, you, you know, for people that have long said that the Apple shouldn't do the hardware, which is, is kind of absurd in some ways, um, that's that's telling. But it could just be Cook doing what Jobs used to do, which is say, no one wants that part. We're working on this thing and then release the whole thing later. Okay. Um, Steve Jobs did also, you know, uh, shall we say, lie... Yeah, it that's what I just stuff. said. Yeah, but I was more blunt about it. I'm trying to remember the way Stop he phrased calling people uh, liars. Reading. Okay, how do you know I've been doing that all day? I'm You've saying. only heard the latest one, and it was, okay, only the low-profile Steve Jobs. The thing that's in my mind is what he said about reading. Didn't he say that nobody in America reads anymore? And about an hour later, he brought out the iBook store, as it then was. Oh. It was the no one wants to watch video on, a, on an iPod screen, and right. then we got the fifth-gen iPod that does video. Okay. Now... It wouldn't be an episode that I like without doing an Apple Health discussion, right? <laughs> Probably not. No. Okay. Yes. So I currently have medical records from a couple of different hospitals and different providers in my iPhone, courtesy of Apple Health, linking to uh, that. Just to check, they are your records. You they just been are angry. my records. I'm not just putting rant. I don't have your records in my iPhone. Okay. God, that'd be what ghastly. Do I? I don't want them. Um, oh. Apple is in discussions with the Department of Veteran Affairs to partner on a program that would grant millions of military vets access to their medical records on the iPhone. And, you know, the, the benefit here is that health record portability is a big deal. Nine million veterans enrolled in the VA system would, would really be helpful in terms of people being able to see what their records say. And it would also help the VA modernize their records management. So this is actually a very cool thing. Health records in iOS stores uh, encrypted patient data. It makes that information portable. It makes it accessible to end users. And it it really bypasses the back-end hurdles that can bog down access to treatment. Anything that means uh, if someone's in trouble and you need details that you've got them there, that's that's great. Or yes. if you're just seeing a provider and the provider, uh, you know, you're going to the ER, for example, but you're not incapacitated and the doctor there says, well, what do you know about your, your medical history? Oh, Great. you can just say, funny you should ask. Yes. And then list off everything. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Back on this date, this is what my blood pressure was. This is what it was. Yeah, exactly. But you should have seen me last Tuesday. Oh, okay. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the news. I want to thank you so much for joining me this week. And, you know, last last week we mentioned PDF Element. If you're still interested in something like that, go ahead and send me, Victor, at Apple Insider, an email. I'm V Marks on Twitter. William, you're W Gallagher. Uh, I'm William at Apple Insider. Sorry, I'm getting mixed around. Twitter, W Gallagher, yes. Thank you. Uh, Send all of your, your fan mail to William at AppleInsider.com, and uh, we should be back next week. I particularly like fan mail that's addressed to Justin Bieber. If you could if you could send that to me, I find that entertaining. Thank you. Oh, I have a friend whose, whose Twitter name is Justin on Twitter, and he gets buried under the worst Justin Bieber fanboyism. You know, he, he, the, the believers believe that he is their Justin. It's nightmarish having the name of. Uh, back, 
We'll be back next week. Thank you very much, everyone.